It's Ken Harbaugh with Burn the Boats on the Midas Touch Network. This week, I am talking with Dr. Bandy Lee, a clinical psychiatrist, about Donald Trump and the duty to warn. That's a common standard in law, medicine, and other professions that obligates practitioners to warn the public or individuals who may be in danger in the case of an explicit threat of harm. During President Trump's first term in office, Dr. Lee saw the danger he posed and raised the alarm as a psychiatrist. She paid dearly for that and lost her job teaching at Yale. We dive into why that happened, into how she has been vindicated, and into the grave danger Donald Trump still poses to America. Before we start, I want to share this clip of Donald Trump demanding cognitive tests for candidates during a recent rally in Nevada. My conversation with Dr. Bandy Lee is right after. And I think anybody running for president should take an aptitude or a cognitive test. I do. I think it. You want to have people that can pass things. And I took one in office. Remember, they were saying, first they said, this guy is brilliant. He wants to take over the world. He wants to take, that didn't work. Then they went to about four different scenarios. Then they said, he wants total control of the United States. He's never going to give up control. He's totally brilliant. Then they went to a different one. That didn't work too much. That didn't scare people. Then they said, he's dumb as a rock. He's dumb as a rock. I said, oh, that one I don't like. So I said to Doc Ronnie, do you know Doc Ronnie? Yes. And... I said to him, you know, Ronnie, I'd like to take a cognitive test. I never heard of it before, but whatever it is. I like tests. I've always liked tests. Tests are very interesting. And, uh, you know, I had an uncle. He's the longest serving professor, Dr. John Trump, in the history of MIT. Same genes. We have genes. We're smart people. We're smart people. You know? We're like race, Mr. Lieutenant Governor, we're like racehorses too. You know, the fast ones produce the fast ones and the slow ones doesn't work out so well, right? But we're no, we're no different in that sense. My guest today is Dr. Bandy Lee, a forensic psychiatrist and an expert on violence. In 2017, she edited The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, in which she and 37 other mental health professionals deemed Trump's mental state to be a clear and present danger to the country. Since then, she has published a full psychological profile of the former president called Profile of a Nation. Dr. Lee, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. As a psychiatrist, you have spent time face-to-face with, and I, I think these are your words, some of the most violent individuals our society has produced. When did you first realize that Donald Trump was not just a showman with political ambitions, but someone who could provoke thousands of his followers to commit acts of violence and who had no reservations about making America as a whole a more violent country? Yes, it may be astonishing for most people because uh, I myself considered Donald Trump simply a shady businessman and an odious personality uh, while I was growing up in New York City. But uh, during his campaign, of course, there were a couple decades of experience with uh, uh, violent offenders who are my patient population uh, that I came to recognize much more. And it simply took a few seconds of watching him on television. I think he was at one of his rallies saying something like, uh, he will pay all the legal fees if you knock uh, uh, the hell out of somebody. And um, and the way he interacted with his followers was uh, the key to my recognizing his personality disposition, uh, which was very much uh, familiar to me from working with street gangs, prison blocks, Uh, and, um, as I said, uh, people with violent personalities. And this isn't just uh, a rhetorical critique of the former president. You're not just talking about his his speeches. This is a a clinical issue. You're talking about his mental state, not his, his performative persona. There is something you argue, going on in his brain that makes him a violent individual 
and able to provoke others to act violently. And, and your insight comes from your experience with very violent people. Yes, and I would say uh, the two are not so uh, distinguishable in that someone uh, whose behavior is aggressive and violent um, will tend to have uh, aggressive thoughts as well as uh, consistent patterns that I came to recognize. And uh, of course, it had nothing to do with being opposed to him as a candidate or political considerations. It's an entirely different paradigm of thinking in psychiatry and medicine, where I was concerned about the safety of others, and especially uh, the public and the nation as a whole. Uh, uh, even though I had not been politically involved uh, as much before um, encountering uh, his dangers, uh, I, I could deduce from uh, from his psychology and the nation's state, what kind of dangers could spread. Can you talk about the duty to warn? I've, I've got a law degree. I'm really drawn to this idea in tort law. And obviously there's a, an analog in the medical profession, because I think we need to understand that to understand the path you chose and the price you paid. What is the duty to warn and, and how did you feel about it when you saw this threat to the nation? Yes, in general, it's a, it's a duty that derives from our responsibility to society. Psychiatrists don't just have a responsibility to patients. They also have a re responsibility to society as outlined clearly in the preamble of the American Psychiatric Association's ethical guidelines, even though they negated it uh, at the onset of the Trump presidency. Um, and uh, well, there, there was a case in uh, California uh, uh, called the Tariff Soft Doctrine uh, that brought about the phrase duty to warn, but the general principle was that confidentiality, which is sacrosanct in medicine and psychiatry, still has um, a rule that supersedes it, and that is the duty to warn against danger. So you can break confidentiality in the case of a patient if the patient expresses uh, an urge to harm others or to uh, become a danger to the public. Now that's in a patient situation. In a public situation, the duty to warn is even more encompassing because there is no confidentiality to break. Uh, whatever we're making our assessment from is public knowledge. And what we're sharing actually is, um, is our, uh, our decades of uh, specialized knowledge, a uh, general knowledge, as well as clinical experience, which uh, we have a duty to share with the public, uh, not just as professionals, but as as citizens who are obligated to share our gifts with society. You sounded the alarm as a clinician about Donald Trump long before just about anybody else in the medical profession, and you paid a a terrible price for it. I want to get to that in a second, but can you talk about your decision to to warn the American public about the the danger that Donald Trump's and I'm probably going to use the wrong word, please correct me, but his his psychopathy, his violent tendencies, his um his his mental proclivity to to provoke violence. You saw that and decided to warn the American people. How did you make that decision to be that public about it, and then we'll talk about the aftermath. Well, I did not seem, uh, I did not consider it so extraordinary at the time. What was extraordinary was the, was the situation, and it was ordinary uh, standard obligation to speak up when there are dangers to the public. We do that in, we would do that in an airport, in a subway station, out in the streets, if we saw somebody who was a danger to the public, we actually cannot just walk away. We have an obligation 
to intervene um, and and even take that person on as a patient. Uh, that is, uh, we don't have a choice not to. Uh, that's one of our medical obligations. And um, so when we saw this unprecedented situation and people were not responding in a commensurate way uh, to the situation, uh, I spoke with a bunch of my colleagues and we actually all agreed there was a medical consensus that this was a very dangerous situation. By the way, dangerousness is not about the individual, it's actually about the situation. Uh, I personally have examined close to a thousand individuals just like Donald Trump, but they're not all the greatest danger to humankind because they are not in the position and situation as uh, Donald Trump had been in the office of the presidency and afterwards. So um, speaking up was, uh, was matter of fact to me. Uh, I thought to myself, well, if I've devoted my entire career to studying, uh, predicting and preventing violence, then why would I turn away in the face of the greatest dangers that we saw? And uh, so my colleagues agreed. That's why I organized the conference at Yale School of Medicine in the beginning of the Trump presidency, where I invited the most highly renowned luminaries of the field. And uh, we decided collectively that it was important for us to speak up. And that gave rise to our first book, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, 27 Psychiatrists and Mental Health Experts Assess the President which was an unprecedented New York Times bestseller of its kind. You said you spent time with and understood the psychopathy of, of more than a thousand individuals with behaviors and symptoms similar to Donald Trump's. I would submit that you probably have more data on the former president from the thousands of hours of his public pronouncements, his speeches, his depositions now, than you probably had on just about any one of those other patients you may have spent a, a couple hours with. This is important for the conversation we're going to have about the Goldwater rule, but is that a, a fair judgment? Yes, absolutely. And I'm not the only one who would say so. Uh, at a conference at Harvard Medical School, uh, among my colleagues, we all agreed that uh, we have more information on Donald Trump than any patient we've ever treated. And so uh, and we've, we've just never had this kind of uh, information objectively, uh, publicly, as well as unfettered access to his stream of consciousness through constant um, social media. And, and so, uh, and as I said, it's not a mystery what he exhibits. Uh, which I recognized within a matter of seconds, not even minutes. And what does he exhibit? I, I want to be accurate. I want to be fair. Um, I'm throwing out words that I think have a, a clinical meaning, but is it psychopathy? Is it narcissistic personality? If you had to summarize it for the rest of our conversation, what is the diagnosis? Yes. Uh, first of all, I'll say that... Um, mental illness does not give rise to dangerousness necessarily. In fact, those who are mentally ill are often more often victims of violence rather than perpetrators. So violence has very little to do with mental illness. But there are a couple diagnoses that you've mentioned that are violence prone, uh, which include psychopathy, uh, which is one of my specialties, and uh, narcissistic personality disorder. Um, borderline person uh, uh, borderline personality disorder and, and and there are a number of um, diagnoses that could predispose to violence either against others or against oneself uh, but uh, dangerousness is is a separate assessment from uh, a diagnosis diagnosis is for individual treatment which you do in a private office you wouldn't divulge a person's diagnosis, unless you get permission from them uh, because they're your private patient. Uh, dangerousness, on the other hand, 
is an assessment that is made for the public. It's not for the individual, and there's really no reason to do a personal interview because dangerous individuals actually often lie and mislead and uh, are very manipulative. And they often even mislead the most seasoned clinician. So you don't uh, make a judgment based on a personal interview. You, you make it based on their objective behavior, uh, how they interact with others, collateral interviews of their coworkers, their uh, family members and friends, um, uh, their criminal history. These are the kinds of things you assess dangerousness on. And, uh, and as I said, uh, it's an evaluation that is done for the public or anyone who is requesting the, the assessment rather than for the individual, and you don't require consent. So you and many others assessed Donald Trump long before most people came to the same conclusion. You assessed him as a danger to society, which he has proven to be. He's provoked riots. He's instigated individual acts of violence. There was a swift and fierce backlash from, well, you'll have to tell me exactly who, but it, it was the, the, the psychiatric um, governing body that invoked a 60s era rule to say you had violated the ethics of your profession uh, and you lost your job at Yale. Can you tell us how that unfolded? Yes. Well, one thing that alarmed me uh, in this um, entire era was the behavior of the American Psychiatric Association, which is not a governing body for the profession. It's one trade association, actually, among many. Uh, the name should not be misleading. They don't have authority over those who are not members, and I was not a member at that time. Uh, in fact, I resigned, uh, even though I was a fellow and received awards through them. Uh, in 2007, I resigned from the organization because they were getting a third of their funding from the pharmaceutical industry, and it seemed to affect their policies. Uh, now, in the Trump era, they did something very odd. They took what was called a Goldwater, the, the Goldwater Rule. It's not actually a rule. It's a guideline. Uh, and you can tell from the name that it was politically uh, driven. Uh, it was inserted into the ethical guidelines, not from uh, clinical experience or, uh, or scientific data, uh, and, and not even a lawsuit against a clinician, but a lawsuit against a tabloid magazine at that time uh, called Fact which basically uh, sensationalized some psychiatrists who spoke ill of uh, Barry Goldwater during his presidential campaign, which led to his landslide loss. Uh, but uh, what the American Psychiatric Association did at that time, they took this very obscure guideline, which nobody considered really important, and it was superfluous because, of course, you don't diagnose someone you haven't examined and you don't uh, speak about their diagnosis un unless you get their permission to do so. That's for private patients. Uh, for everybody, it holds, uh, it holds for anybody. But they specifically uh, singled out public figures and said public figures should not be diagnosed without a personal exam and uh, their diagnosis should not be publicized without consent. That didn't need to be said. It applies to everybody. But they're, they're giving public figures' privilege, uh, this kind of singular privilege, has led them to be able to say in the Trump era, uh, as soon as he was inaugurated, it did not take two months for them to announce that the so-called Goldwater rule meant that psychiatrists could not make any comment, not just diagnosis, but any comment uh, in any situation, regardless of the danger he posed to society, um, and even in a national emergency. This, to me, uh, just had glaring red alarms uh, attached to it because this was, first of all, not what the guideline was supposed to be. The guideline, actually, those who are specialists in it would say it's an affirmative obligation because it points to the only way it got in was because it was uh, a 
a guideline on our societal role. So what it actually says is uh, that psychiatrists have an obligation to participate in activities that improve the community and better public health. When we're asked about a public figure, uh, educate the public generally, but just don't diagnose. And we wouldn't diagnose anyway, because they're not our patient. And a diagnosis is, again, irrelevant to the public's interest. What is, what is relevant is dangerousness and unfitness. And neither of these require a personal interview. Uh, you try to get one, but uh, they don't. It's not the foremost requirement. And that has been the focus of your assessment of the former president, his dangerousness, not his individual mental state. Is that right? Not his diagnosis Got and it. not anything of interest in treating him as a patient. He is not a patient. And um, he uh, he is of interest to us only because of the danger he poses to public health and public mental health. Now, the champion of uh, the Goldwater rule during the Trump era was Jeffrey Lieberman, who is a heavily pharmaceutical industry funded psychiatrist. And he was recently removed from his position uh, as chair of Columbia's psychiatry department because of uh, uh, his inappropriate uh, uh, disparaging of uh, races and uh, women, I feel, that he's practiced for decades. Uh, but um, the pharmaceutical industry has been promulgating the notion that uh, psychiatry is all about just individual treatment that you do secretly uh, in a private office uh, and for the purpose of treating with medications and whatever you cannot treat with medications does not even exist. Now, this is antithetical to every um, tenet in psychiatry, which is biopsychosocial and increasingly ecological. Uh, but uh, there are many psychiatrists who are taking on this position, and he was one of them. I'm intrigued by the phrase biopsychosocial, especially the social aspect, because you have written and spoken a lot about the the societal impact of of mental health. We just had Dr. Stephen Hassan on, uh, and I, I think you have worked with him in in the past. And he beats this drum very very loudly about the importance of understanding the societal aspects of mental health. Can you talk about declining mental health as a contagion, as something that a society can suffer from, and not just an individual? Yes. Uh, again, it's a fallacy to think of mental health issues as affecting only individuals. In fact, um, we know very well about uh, emotional contagion and uh, even mental symptoms are not confined to individuals. They can be even more infectious than physical diseases, certain physical diseases, because you don't require physical exposure for the symptoms to spread. And so uh, I warned against uh, Donald Trump's psychological dangers spreading into social, cultural, geopolitical, and civic dangers for a very long time. Um, there was a conference I held at the National Press Club in 2019, bringing together uh, experts of top experts from all different fields for that reason. And I thought that would be the beginning of mental health being a part of the conversation. But in, in essence, uh, we never recovered from the American Psychiatric Association's uh, intervention and slander, really, calling us armchair psychiatrists, uh, doing what we were for self-aggrandizing reasons and using psychiatry as a political tool. You can al already tell it's not a very professional use of language and breaks their newly revised own Goldwater rule because we were public figures by that time. Um, but that has more to do with authoritarianism than uh, than psychiatric a proper application of psychiatric principles. So uh, I had been concerned about Donald Trump as a public health threat from the very beginning. That's what I said in the very introduction of the dangerous case of Donald Trump. 
And what we're seeing today is the spread of what I'm now calling Trump contagion, uh, which is the spread of symptoms. And all psychiatric symptoms are psychosocial, uh, biopsychosocial, to be more exact. Uh, they're not confined to the individual. And, um, and this is what we had cautioned against and feared because one of the problems of the spread of mental symptoms is that uh, unlike any other symptom, it comes with uh, the loss of insight, uh, which is awareness that one is ill or unwillingness to recognize it. So the sicker one is, the farther one will run from hospitals and doctors and anything that would get them better. And uh, and again, the APA, instead of educating the public on the need to inform ourselves of psychiatric principles and to prevent further um, regression into uh, into a state of poor health, uh, they took advantage and exploited the symptoms in order to gain political and financial advantage. Thanks for watching, everyone. I am trying something new, a Patreon page. It's a way you can support the show and make sure we can keep bringing you this content. My hope is that we can continue to limit the amount of ads we run here and that we can also build a community around this effort to fight back against extremists and their enablers. Subscribers to the Patreon page will have access to exclusive and ad-free content and also early releases. Please consider helping us out. Go to patreon.com slash Ken Harbaugh or click on the link below. We're just getting started with this, so your support early on will make a huge difference in building real momentum. Thanks so much for helping out. As you all probably know, I am married with kids. And honestly, using policy genius to find the right life insurance has never been more important. Make life insurance part of your financial planning this year. Start shopping now with policy genius to find the right policy to protect your family. Getting life insurance today means you'll have peace of mind so that if something were to happen to you, your family can cover expenses while getting back on their feet. Luckily, Policy Genius helps you compare your options from top companies, and their team of licensed experts is on hand to help talk you through it. Policy Genius's technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest price. Even if you already have a life insurance policy through work, it may not offer enough protection for your family's needs, and it may not follow you if you leave your job. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for a million dollars of coverage. Some options offer same day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius has licensed, award winning agents who can help you find the best fit for your needs. They work for you, not the insurance companies. That means they don't have an incentive to recommend one insurer over another so you can trust their guidance. No wonder they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. Save time and money and provide your family with a financial safety net using Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com slash boats or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com slash boats. Most clothes are uncomfortable or too tight or never actually the size you really are, not to mention the annoyance of trying to put a good outfit together. Everyone wants to dress their best and look good at all times because, frankly, it's a confidence booster. So here's the deal. Men's closets were due for a radical reinvention, and Roan stepped up to the challenge. Their commuter collection is the most comfortable, breathable, and flexible set of products known to man. They help you get ready for any occasion with the Roan Commuter Collection, which offers the world's most comfortable pants, dress shirts, zips, and polos. You never have to worry about what to wear when you have the Roan Commuter Collection. Their four-way stretch fabric provides breathability and flexibility that leaves you free to enjoy what life throws your way from your commute to work to your 18 holes of golf. It's time to feel confident without the hassle. With Roan's wrinkle release technology, wrinkles disappear as you stretch and wear the products. It's that easy. With Gold Fusion anti-odor technology, you'll be smelling fresh and clean all day long. And on top of that, Roan is 100% machine washable, so you can ditch the dry cleaner altogether. 
I absolutely love Roan. It's comfortable yet professional and has truly become my favorite clothing brand. We're on the move a lot, whether it's jumping from meeting to meeting or catching a flight or an important dinner. The Roan commuter collection has never let me down. The versatility and overall comfort of the collection is undefeated. Even after I wear it all day, I still feel super fresh because of that Gold Fusion anti-odor technology. The commuter collection can get you through any workday and straight into whatever comes next. Head to roan.com slash boats and use promo code boats to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off your entire order when you head to rhone.com slash boats and use code boats. It's time to find your corner office comfort. Heart health and staying healthy, especially when you have family, friends, or loved ones that you want to be able to spend as much time as possible with is so important. February is Heart Health Month in the U.S., and more than half the population would benefit from blood pressure support. Super Beats Heart Shoes are the number one doctor, pharmacist, and cardiologist recommended way to support healthy blood pressure. And they even promote heart healthy energy without the stimulants. Paired with a healthy lifestyle, the antioxidants in Super Beats are clinically shown to be nearly two times more effective at promoting normal blood pressure than a healthy lifestyle alone. And with over 40,000 five star reviews and counting, People are raving about Super Beats Heart Shoes. Super Beats Heart Shoes are absolutely delicious and are much better than any alternative supplement out there. Super Beats is also the number one doctor, pharmacist, and cardiologist recommended heart shoe for cardiovascular health support. It's blood pressure support you can trust. Support your heart health with Super Beats Heart Shoes. Get a free month supply of Super Beats Heart Shoes on all bundles and a free full-size bag of turmeric shoes valued at $25 with your order by going to BoatsBeats.com. Get this exclusive offer only at BoatsBeats.com. Have you ever wished that you had a whiter and brighter smile? Well, before you visit a dentist, you should know that their whitening treatments can be very expensive. And it's not just the price. You also have to book the appointment and schedule time away from work or family to sit in a dentist chair while undergoing the procedure. It's a hassle. Fortunately, now you can try Smile Actives at home or anywhere anytime. Smile Actives offers a safe and affordable alternative to those expensive whitening procedures. 97% of Smile Actives users in a clinical trial reported up to six shades whiter on average all within 30 days. Simply add Smile Actives Pro Whitening Gel to your regular toothpaste. It's been formulated with polyclean technology to boost stain removal and deliver active whitening ingredients into teeth grooves and crannies to get better whitening. Smile Actives makes a teeth whitening gel that can simply be added to your toothpaste every time you brush your teeth. So no change in your routine, no extra time, and no more messy strips, trays, or lights. People will start commenting on your whiter, brighter smile in days. Smile Actives is the whitening boost your favorite toothpaste needs to give you the smile you deserve. Visit smileactives.com slash boats today to receive a special buy one, get one free offer with auto delivery plus free shipping and handling. That's smileactives.com slash boats. Terms and conditions apply. See site for details. Can you elaborate on the contagious nature of this phenomenon? Because I, I think it'll be obvious to some people, but not everybody, that you're talking about social media as a vector. You're talking about the internet itself as having the the power to transmit this in a way that a, a, an airborne disease, you know, would require proximity or or, or another kind of disease would require contact. The type of mental health issues you're talking about can cross oceans in milliseconds. Yes, that's right. Uh, well, any contagious disease requires at least three um, conditions to be able to spread. And, and one is uh, a primary agent, um, meaning um, the uh, the infectious agent. Um, secondly, uh, an environment that facilitates transmission. And thirdly, weakened hosts. Um, and we can apply those principles in the exact same way to, um, to mental symptoms. And uh, I've actually seen this quite a bit as 
a prison psychiatrist and a public sector psychiatrist working in uh, in jails and prisons and state hospital settings where individuals can go for extended periods of time being untreated and uh, their symptoms become very severe. What happens is that rather than healthy individuals making them well in the ordinary setting without the intervention of experts and, uh, and treatment settings, that, um, uh, that it's really the, the symptomatic uh, person who spreads their symptoms because there's such a high emotional drive behind their uh, delusions, their paranoid ideas, their fear, uh, their um, violence proneness, that it becomes infectious far more than any kind of rational persuasion. So that if they are isolated with family members, for example, or enclosed in a community, uh, and it has been described as a phenomenon nationwide uh, by persons such as Carl Jung or Eric Fromm, uh, who have described how this can happen to an entire nation. Uh, but it's the same phenomenon that I've observed in, uh, in smaller settings uh, with street gangs, with uh, family members. And what happens, uh, and, and this is a well-described phenomenon, at the severe stages, it's called shared psychosis. You can diagnose it in an individual as shared psychotic disorder, but uh, it occurs uh, more generally as a phenomenon of shared psychosis in that um, the secondary individuals, previously healthy or predisposed individuals, come to look almost identical to the person with a primary illness, such that as a clinician, when you go into this setting, um, it's almost impossible to tell apart who's primary from who's secondary un until you do a uh, history and figure out who um, originated these symptoms, who, who transmitted these symptoms in the beginning. The treatment is removal of the offending agent, in other words, the person with the primary symptoms. You hospitalize them, you separate them in, uh, into different cell blocks, and the uh, symptoms in the transmitted individuals uh, dramatically decline. Um, now, there, there are some variants to this, but, uh, but that's the general picture. And what I found and what I feared was that Donald Trump, with the exposure that he had from an influential position, would uh, similarly transmit symptoms through the emotional bonds that he formed and through the insulation from other ideas uh, evidence, facts, rational discussions that he would create by uh, disparaging other news sources. He, uh, he called real news fake news. He said, even at one point, don't believe your eyes and ears, uh, but just listen to what I say. When it comes to a, a physical disease, that that is transmitted i understand the concept of the the weakened host someone with a, a compromised immune system or something like that when it comes to a biopsychosocial transmission can you talk about what weakens a host you you alluded to isolation or insulation surely there are aspects of american society that make us if not uniquely susceptible than unusually susceptible to this kind of transmission, this kind of manipulation? Why are so many individuals and collectively groups in our society weakened hosts? Yes, uh, I would go back a little in, uh, to describe that because uh, I had been concerned about the rise of somebody like Donald Trump uh, because I was observing a weakening of the nation's collective mental health, uh, mainly through the socioeconomic policies that uh, vastly accelerated inequality. And uh, 
Inequality is not just deprivation of material goods. It has a very strong uh, influence on on the nation's psychology. And you can imagine that this kind of uh, oppression and uh, injustice that results from uh, inequality uh, actually uh, impairs the nation's ability to reach its full potential psychologically uh, and, and mental health wise. So that was the background. And when I saw Fox News first air, I believe it was in the late 90s, um, I was still in training at that time, but I thought to myself that, well, if this were to continue, then uh, there would be serious ramifications for the nation's mental health. And lo and behold, uh, around, um, I believe, the early 2000s, it was a number one uh, news program, so-called news program, because it's not really news, it's spreading uh, misinformation as well as uh, conditioning people not to be able to uh, critically take in facts and and uh, uh, logical uh, conclusions. So, um, so that was a setting in which Donald Trump rose, and uh, astonishingly, um, the violent individuals that I saw mostly in jails and prisons and uh, seemed to be confined in the correctional setting for the most part earlier in my career. Over the course of my 25-year um, practice, I have noticed that more and more such individuals were taking leadership positions, such as uh, chief executive officers, judicial roles, and now politicians. And that was the setting in which Donald Trump uh, came to uh, the presidency. And... Uh, and also as part of the environment was the change in the media landscape in that non-news was held to be the same as news uh, and just as a imp mentally impaired individual next to a healthy individual um, would be no contest. In other words, if given th this kind of public exposure, such as uh, through being a presidential candidate, then the, the symptoms will spread much more rapidly than any kind of rational, uh, rational persuasion. So, uh, so the media landscape changing, uh, including social media, which you can tell by the expressions, uh, things going viral, um, make, make them more conducive to spreading mental symptoms. In assessing the danger that someone like Donald Trump poses to society, a historically significant figure like the former president, does it help to have a, a sense of history? Did you have a, a frame of reference beyond just your clinical experience? Do you have a, a background in the the rhetoric and behavior of someone like Mussolini or Franco? Do you make those kinds of comparisons in making a threat assessment? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I'm not a historian. Uh, a historian brings a historical perspective to all kinds of settings and uh, could be um, uh, a minor focus or a larger societal focus. Uh, Psychiatrists would do the same, I would argue. We bring a mental health lens, a uh, psychological lens, either to uh, the individual setting or the population setting. And as a uh, uh, social psychiatrist, I trained in medical anthropology and I worked with the World Health Organization on public health approaches to violence prevention. So I'm used to working with populations and thinking in terms of prevention. Uh, working with large, larger scales and had uh, consulted and advised on policy making with a number of governments, both uh, domestically and abroad. So, uh, so I was used to thinking in these terms, um, which, which are very easy to carry into historical contexts. 
uh, when I think of something like Benito Mussolini or Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, uh, I don't think so much, uh, I don't bring the historical perspective or the political perspective, but I bring a psychological perspective. And they make total sense to me because that's exactly what will happen. Uh, what has happened is exactly what will occur if any of the individuals that I've treated, the dangerous personality disorders that I have treated, were put in such positions of power. So again, dangerousness is about the situation. Uh, and Donald Trump may have just remained an odious businessman that nobody liked and would uh, succeed and do lots of damage in his pe petty business, but not be a threat to the survival of humankind as he is now if he were not given the power. You've described, I guess implicitly, Donald Trump as a threat to America's soul. Your last book was titled Trump's Mind, America's Soul, and your assessment of the danger he poses implicates the, the broader nation. Can you explain extending uh, that that assessment to to America itself and how our soul is affected by the former president? Yes, I have mentioned that because the trajectory we are in is very perilous. I think many people recognize that. When I said that Donald Trump was dangerous and at the onset of the presidency, uh, People may have thought that I was being hyperbolic or exaggerating, but uh, many years later, I think we can see why that uh, that kind of framing was necessary. Um, since the spread of the Trump contagion, I've also described the course we are on as a death spiral, because from my perspective, uh, fascism is not a political ideology, it is mental pathology in politics. And the course of mental pathology is destruction and death, regardless of what uh, the afflicted persons, groups, uh, nation will claim. Uh, and we have seen this historically through other leaders, when uh, none of these leaders were mentally healthy. Uh, in fact, if one is healthy, uh, one's decisions will be life-affirming, regardless of one's ideology. So it's really not about ideology or uh, political positions. Um, I mentioned the soul so that we would truly take this seriously, and ultimately it is a matter of our own uh, ethical and spiritual grounding, if you will, uh, our ability to uh, keep our center and uh, confront uh, the onslaught of this pathology and to stand up for, for truth and health and what is right uh, that will save the nation. And uh, because pathology comes with an innate death drive, and in order to resist it, uh, it, it is a kind of war. Uh, Mohandas Gandhi spoke of uh, nonviolence training as the training of a warrior uh, and I would see the task before us as being very similar. Uh, psychiatry can bring us only so far. As, as a mental health professional, it's been extremely difficult for me to watch uh, on the sidelines once I was removed from public discourse by the APA. Um, at one point, we were the number one topic of national conversation three three months after our book was released. Our first book was released, and we had uh, an extremely hearty reception by the public. 
uh, our our New York Times bestseller was uh, nothing that Macmillan, one of the five big publishers, was even prepared for. It took them five weeks to replenish the stock so that they could keep up with the demand. And um, that was organic. Uh, all the news networks, uh, network news and cable news, all the major programs invited me. And I myself was astonished that there was no barrier and no stigma attached to speaking about mental health. They simply called me on as any other expert on an area of expertise. It was really after the APA intervened, recruiting the New York Times to denounce us as being unethical, when in fact we were trying to fulfill our societal ethical duty, um, that that uh, we were excluded from discourse and and what we exactly what we predicted that without proper intervention, without proper knowledge, uh, we have uh, the nation has suffered. Uh, calamity and destruction in ways that um, of the exact severity and exact timeline that we predicted. I, I don't imagine you derive much satisfaction from the vindication of seeing your predictions play out. It, uh, it's, it's vindication, but it can't feel good to, to see your predictions about Trump's violent tendencies actually made real. Well, vindication was what I've been hearing, even from Congress members, since the uh, January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. Uh, and there was a, a, a major article subtitled The Vindication of Andy Lee by Mother Jones, as you may know. Um, but my concern is, three years later, where are we? Where are the mental health voices? Uh, why are those who are speaking about mental health issues only non-experts? Um, and if we as a nation cannot derive the correct knowledge, um, the proper knowledge, and intervene properly uh, for a given crisis, it's not always the case that we're dealing with a mental health crisis, but in this case, it is. Uh, then why will we not hear from the appropriate experts and why are we still sidelined? So for me, the vindication is not very uh, relieving. It's, uh, it's rather more tragic. One of the MOs of the former president and probably most psychopathic personalities when they are uh, accused of of crimes or misdeeds is to immediately turn a turn around and accuse their their accusers. Um, Alan Dershowitz has been in the news a lot lately, alongside the former president, for reasons that that many people probably know about. Not the subject of this interview, but we we may do another one when when more facts come out. But you tweeted this out about uh, about both of them on this phenomenon. If you understand offender psychology, they actually make it easy for you. They falsely accuse with the exact severity they need to be correctly accused. Consider this whenever Donald Trump or Alan Dershowitz makes an accusation. Yes, that is uh, called projective identification and uh, it's a commonly observed phenomenon. Actually, um, I like to use Dr. Jennifer Freight's phrase, DARVO, uh, or acronym DARVO, which means deny, attack, and reverse offender and victim. Uh, and that's the way that they respond. Those who deal with violent offenders know that this is coming. In other words, uh, First, you can recognize where they are guilty by how they accuse others. Uh, as we know, Alan Dershowitz um, uh, suppressed uh, my speech by, uh, uh, by complaining to Yale and, uh, and causing my termination after 17 years of teaching there and um, uh, also uh, 
my students student years were spent there. So after about 30 years uh, of devotion to Yale, I was removed without due process. And, um, and that was purely Alan Dershowitz's doing because it was within 48 hours of his complaining that I heard from my superiors who knew me and supported me and actually uh, just a couple years prior affirmed my right to uh, academic freedom. Um, now Alan Dershowitz is uh, going around campuses and law firms stating that uh, students who think a certain way and um, and uh, uh, law firms that hire lawyers that think a certain way should be called out and sanctioned uh, and students and lawyers be removed. Um, and essentially something that no other legal professional would agree with. I think actually another lawyer described it as the new McCarthyism. And so we see that um, we see that violent personalities will accuse others of their own guilt and their own crimes in order to deny uh, what they've committed and to uh, to essentially alleviate their own psyches by attributing their own uh, unacceptable thoughts and deeds onto others. And the more severely impaired they are, the more they will do so. So, uh, so it's a good measure that clinicians use. Dr. Lee, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Love this video? Make sure you stay up to date on the latest breaking news and all things Midas by signing up to the Midas Touch newsletter at MidasTouch.com newsletter.